We live in a culture that tries to consume as much as possible, as fast as possible. But what happens when you're in a field that absolutely requires it? For the last six years in medical school, I've been shown, required to know, questioned on more information than I ever thought possible. And what I've realized is, I think we were taught to learn wrong. Anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, pathology, law, ethics have tested what feels like the biological limits of my own brain to understand and memorize information. The reality of the matter remains, a few weeks ago, I had to sit four exams with only the information in my head and no excuses for shoddy teaching or too much to know or even my own medical records of having a poor memory were at all relevant. Having just passed my medical school finals, I wanted to share the exact method that I used to learn. I have researched, tested, adjusted so many techniques for learning and memorizing, and for the past two years, all of my note-taking, revising, writing, studying has been done on this tiny little notebook that I took with me everywhere. I'm going to go through its two sides, how and why I structure it this way, what I write, and eventually how I got my brain to memorize everything I needed it to know. In this process, I will be deconstructing some of the less effective study methods I used to use in the past, and hopefully build a more evidence-based framework. Let's get straight into it. Firstly, we cannot talk about learning without addressing one of the biggest ways that we set ourselves up to fail, the use of overprocessed source material to study. We like to focus on better ways for understanding or memorizing information while completely ignoring the ways in which our brain first encounters this information and therefore we end up not really improving our learning overall. And we can be excused for this. For the longest time, the form of presenting information wasn't really a priority. The traditional view on learning until recently held that as students, our brains are like brick walls with new bricks, like new pieces of information just being added to the right place. By this view, which many universities, including mine, implicitly hold, it is therefore the role of the teacher to process and summarize information like a brick for us to consume and learn. This, however, is not how our brains work. Our brains are not like empty heads or walls waiting to be filled, they are rather active organisms in constructing knowledge. According to more modern theories, it is the process of creating connections between different types of information and modifying our pre-existing cognitive structures that is learning, and this, for a lot of us, is a massive problem. Most of us get given or actively seek out highly processed materials to work with by using things like pre-made mind maps, revision notes, revision books, even lecture slides or lecture notes themselves. Our learning is being prevented because most of these connections are already made. Because someone else, like the lecturer or the writer, has done that work for us, we are not able to do it. And our learning does not happen effectively. What we are left with is superficial learning, like memorizing. Two researchers, Kitchener and King, worked with thousands of students over 10 years to confirm that the more ill-structured material that was used as a source of knowledge, the higher the level of learning achieved and the closer the results to what we would consider wisdom. Even though the use of summaries and tidied up knowledge in higher education has been shown to be problematic for learning, I still see so many students wanting to find and share lecture notes and revision notes, and even I was one of them back in my first year before I knew any of this. I find it more helpful to see learning as nothing more than the structuring of information, and that structuring is what I'm going to try and show today. When it comes to what actually goes in my notebook, I would actively seek out as ill-structured material as possible. This means going to sites like PubMed, which is a favourite of mine, using papers, studies, very detailed textbooks that explore a topic in a lot of detail and allow me to do the processing, which I'll explain in a second, while completely ignoring all revision notes, lecture notes, summaries, by maps, anything like that. In this way, most of my actual learning ends up being only structuring things and seeing where they fit in with each other and what I already know. If ignoring the lecturer and their notes seems quite radical, there are some very interesting sources, which I'll link down below, that state that it is not actually the role of the teacher to teach us. This is not something that they ever have been able or will ever be able to do. The person who determines both what is to be learned and who does the actual learning is always us, 
the student. Personally, for me, I treat a lecture as a space to know what I'm expected to know and as a source of more detailed information. And I have not looked at any lecture notes since my first year in medicine. Before I progress with how I presented this information in my notebook, I do have to say that as difficult as grasping all of this information was, the challenge of actually learning was nothing compared to the mental stress of it all. I genuinely thought that at this grown age and after six years, I would not be phased by these exams, but I have to say they absolutely broke me. The sheer amount of information that I had to keep inside my tiny brain at a single time was so much that I constantly felt like I was going to fail, that I could never do it, and I cursed myself so much for starting this YouTube channel and not spending every single hour studying instead. As put together, as I seem now, and as ridiculous as this all feels now that it's all done and over, for weeks and weeks my biggest problem was that my levels of stress and anxiety were keeping me from actually studying. Whether I am stupid and forget or sharp and intelligent depends so much more on my levels of confidence and happiness and mental stability than anything else and any technique or information that I know. And let me just say I have been so stupid recently. Reflecting the structure of my actual brain, half of this channel is about learning techniques and the other half about therapy. I've been in therapy for years now, both in person and online for the last two years. And honestly, it is the only reason I managed to make these videos, survive the medical school finals and all the other sometimes very generous issues that life tends to throw at me. This video is a paid partnership with BetterHelp and I am so excited to have more therapy links to give. As I'm sure we all know, BetterHelp is an online platform which connects us with credentialed therapists in order to receive remote online therapy. The beauty of it in particular is that it minimizes the physical limitations that we usually have in order to access therapy. Even living in London, it is very hard for me to find the time to travel and do in-person therapy as much as I genuinely wish I could. You get matched with a therapist almost immediately based on your preferences, needs, and interests. I love about them in particular is that they almost expect you to shop around until you find the best fit for you. And so switching therapists is made to be the most frictionless and comfortable process ever. I genuinely have so much to say on the topic of therapy. I have previously filmed a video on everything that I wish I knew and was told before I started therapy for the first time. And I'll link that unlisted video down below. And it should be particularly helpful for you if you are a complete novice to that. Alongside that, I also have a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com slash Elizabeth Phillips, or you can use Elizabeth Phillips at checkout, which will give you 10% off your first month. If you've ever considered starting or reattempting therapy, I would definitely give them a try. I've had an incredible personal experience with my therapy with them, and I want to thank them so much, both for supporting this channel and for having more people talk about therapy and for making it more accessible, which is definitely something I am super passionate about. Now, Let's get back to the notebook. The first part I'll explain in the notebook is the revising or the memorizing part. Now, a good reason why learning and memorizing everything in university is hard is because that's not what our brains were meant to do. As Professor Jocelyn at the University of Toronto explains, our brains are not there to go, hey, remember that time? They are there to help us make decisions. We are supposed to store what we understand and what helps us make better choices. When information is stored and processed in this way, it also kind of folds up really well and takes less space. And therefore we are able to understand, memorize and store a lot more information. Now, the way that I apply this rule is by completely kind of turning learning on its head. The way that I picture things is that usually they are given to us in a vertical format. What this means to me is that there is usually a title, the title of a revision page or a chapter or a mind map, and all of the information that I'm supposed to know about it sits below, kind of vertically. It is the tag or the title that I'm supposed to know and prompt and all the information beneath it I'm supposed to hold. Sometimes receiving this vertical information is not a big problem. Maybe there is not that much new information there, or it's quite easy to understand, or there's not so many of them overall, and I can revise them enough times that I can recall them in time for my exams. This is how I used to study in high school. Everything was given in this top sentence 
vertical information structure and I could absorb it perfectly. When, however, as things often are in university and definitely in medical school, the amount of vertical information in a single topic is absolutely immense and I can build 20, 40 of these a day. I have to sit six lectures a day, five days a week. I'm seeing hundreds of new words every single day. Most of what I'm being presented with is absolutely brand new and it fits nowhere inside my brain. I'm screwed. I do just have to disclose that my memory is so poor. I must be the only medical student who does not know a single mnemonic. When people ask what has bed or stitches or bandages or whatever mnemonics, I have no clue. I genuinely do not know how people memorize those things. And so I had to depend on logic to learn. And honestly, it helps so much with understanding and memory. To highlight how I study not vertically, but horizontally, I will show how I studied eye conditions. To build a horizontal structure for the whole of ophthalmology or eye conditions for my notebook, I will try to use as ill-structured material as possible. My favorite is PubMed, where I can search each of the eye conditions and I will try to find a paper or a reference book which has as much detail as possible on just one of them. What I then do is I scan and I read this whole text and I take from it the parts that are relevant to my specific case, the things that I need to know as a doctor who needs to sit specific exams. I'll flesh out all of the details that I need to know. Sometimes I will remove or add information where necessary for the level of detail until I have a good concept of each of their conditions summarized quite well. What I'm left with is something very, very condensed and small, which I could have gotten within two seconds of googling somewhere or just looking at any sort of lecture slides. But in that case, that would be useless information because all of the context for where all of these details came from would be missing. The very process of finding out what is relevant to me in the sea of information in PubMed is learning because I am using the cognitive structures that are already in my head to compare with this new information and flesh out what I need to know and therefore I am making connections between random newness and what already exists because I am using what is already in my head, the cognitive structures I already have, to figure out what I need to know, this process is making actual connections between the known and the unknown, and therefore this is active learning. So even though the end result looks exactly the same, if not a million times worse than what my lecturer could have given me, the actual process of creating it is where my learning happened, and I did not skip this step. What I do next is take all of the eye conditions that I have processed in this way and list them in a horizontal, not a vertical manner. Instead of having a topic stuck in my brain as eye conditions and then all of this random information unconnected with each other being a huge vertical thing, which realistically I'm going to forget the details of, I now am going to connect them in unique ways that I will create. So I will create subgroups based on similarities or differences that they have with each other and create new, shorter subheadings. For example, I will see that eye conditions can be grouped based on them being painful or painless, more or less likely to happen in diabetic patients, grouped on the patient's likely age at time of presentation, whether or whether or not they can receive treatment, if they are or aren't permanent, how urgent they are, traumatic or non-traumatic. I'm therefore creating horizontal sections and connections between these different conditions, which means that they are grouped in more than one way, and therefore they are a lot easier to remember. In the end, depending on how difficult or how new the topic is, or how many times I've encountered it in the past, I will have a good gist of how much work I will need to do to memorize it. When it is something that I've encountered a lot of times, I know that I just probably need one to pick just one mind map structure. So one characteristic, is it painful or non-painful, traumatic or non-traumatic, and capture it that way in my notebook, because I know that's gonna be enough for me to memorize it. And the process that I've just done, I'm pretty confident is going to stick in my head. So I pick the connection and the structure that's the most effective to remember and capture that in my notebook. If it was particularly difficult, I'd probably do two different mind maps or three or four based on different characteristics, organized horizontally. I call this process flattening because I do not let too much new information grow vertically on its own. When I see that on any particular topic, I just have too much random unconnected information, I will then grab one bit of it and link it to something else that I know in my brain already. And these conditions do not absolutely need to be purely clinical at all. If I have something quite new and complicated in ophthalmology and I've 
run out of my anchors or oversaturated them and it's very vertical and difficult to learn, I can connect it to something completely else in my brain. For example, how the visual impairment in children might link to the psychological developmental delay of the child. And therefore I link this difficult to remember detail to something very well meshed in my brain, which is psychology. And therefore this anchors it a lot deeper and very well. I have a good connection of ophthalmology, which I don't know much about, with psychology, which I love and hopefully know a lot more about. So that helps anchor ophthalmology in my brain. Sometimes I need to relearn something I thought I knew in light of new information or completely have to change the structure. With ophthalmology in particular, I didn't realize in my fourth year that I had not run into so many different conditions. So I had to rewrite everything in my study for my finals recently. I try to keep every summary in my notebook to one or two pages so I can look at them all at a glance and flip through them easily. This is why I only pick one characteristic to group them by. The main question I ask myself when learning in this way is how does this fit in with what I already know and how do I need to change what I already know in order to fit this information? I know I can find better summaries and representations of these online, but that is not the point. As Eisner said in 1993, the forms of representation provide the means through which meaning is made. The finding of the structure to write these things out and writing it out is the learning. There is a concept I find fascinatingly creepy which closely relates to this. I wanted to share it with you in case the imagery also helps. In his book, Objects of Time, How Things Shape Temporality, Kevin Berth refers to necromantic devices. Objects where the original thinkers behind them are hidden from the consciousness of their users and therefore the assumptions and decisions on which they were created remain also hidden. When the person who synthesized the information, which we are trying to learn, does not tell us why these connections are being made, for example, in the case of a bad lecturer not saying this to you or not having access to the person because it's some student from five years ago whose notes you were sh shared or some author of a book who God knows who they are or they might be dead, we are using a necromantic device. This notebook is exactly the opposite of a necromantic device to me because what it captures is exactly the logic and the decisions that were being made when these connections were made. Even though they're not explicitly there, at a glance, I can remember what I was thinking when I made them. The capture of labor becomes a process of active learning and just glancing at it, being able to get so much more information than is actually written in those words because I have the memory of why I created it in this way makes revision a million times more effective. If this seems like a lot of work, which I guess in some ways it is, let me reassure you that you do absolutely not need to do this immediately after a lecture or even consistently at all. I work full time alongside university and I am absolutely not able to study every single day or sometimes even every week. This is a process that can very effectively be done a lot later. Moon describes exactly this with the process of deepening when we reapproach something that we have learned superficially in the past and make genuine effective connections that can be done at a much later date. I usually prefer to do this when I have the time to cover the whole topic in its entirety and make all the connections that are needed for it. Last massive benefit to this before we move on to our next point is the avoidance and minimization of retroactive interference. This is a fancy way of saying that when you create new memories, they kind of impact and block your retrieval of older memories, which very often happens with learning. Every time that I'm doing this, I am using what I previously know. So I'm always revising, maybe not 100%, but most of what already exists in my brain. So my learning and revising kind of become the same process together and therefore avoiding the negative impacts of forgetting. Now that we've finished the business in the back, we have the party in the front side of the notebook. And while we just went through a part where it's highly intentional, everything is one or two pages, the pages are numbered, I'm kind of careful with what I write in here. This front part is absolute and complete chaos and it is very very intentionally so this front of my notebook is my daily driver and this is why it's really important for me to carry it absolutely everywhere because this is where the capture of a lot of my unprocessed thoughts happens say i'm in a lecture i've spoken before and there's a whole video i'll probably link somewhere where i talk about why i think it's absolutely pointless to take lecture notes in a lecture at least in medicine um what i will capture however is those rare moments where a lecturer gives some insight or makes a connection which I find new and interesting and that I don't think is going to be written anywhere and that I could not have come up to on my own. I will capture that connection as a line only. Another important thing that I capture here is that say a lecturer is talking in quite 
convoluted formal scientific medical language. If I'm actually paying attention and trying to understand, what I'm doing in my head is translating what they're saying into expressive informal language. And when I come up with an understanding or a conclusion, which I know is really, really complex and I needed to do like 12 steps of understanding to get there. And I know that I'm not going to be able to do this from scratch later when I go home. I'm sure you've experienced this, hopefully, or at some point. I will capture that understanding down because that's kind of a nugget of insight that I won't be able to get. So I'll write down that common sense understanding in my notebook to use for the structuring of my summaries later. This language issue is actually a very big problem in our learning. And this is why I have a division between using quite expressive and informal language on the front bit of my notebook. And what we saw earlier is usually going to be much more formal scientific language. Parkin Adgunkin in 1987 said that formal educational language can set up a barrier between us and the subject matter. They describe how we tend to think in informal expressive language, yet we are asked to speak or we hear others speak and we're asked to write in very formal language. But when we are trying to understand something new, puzzling, troubling, or intriguing, our brain automatically switches to the informal language. It's almost like our brains are supposed to learn in that way. And yet we're kind of got this barrier that makes that learning just that bit harder. Because learning on this side is fully informal and expressive, this is where a lot of my understanding is captured and done. Another great use of this notebook being so small that I can fit into my scrubs is the fact that whenever a doctor is explaining something and they're like, oh, I need a piece of paper um, to show a diagram, I will just hand them my notebook and be like, oh, can you can you write it in here, please? And there's quite a few different things here that you can see there's different types of handwriting because lots of different doctors will just grab it and make their own notes. And I get to keep these forever and use them to study later. For medics specifically, having a scrub size notebook is so helpful because when I am talking to a patient with a very complex history, I will get the permission. And because this is so little, I can just balance it on my knee and look into their eyes. And I will kind of take notes of what they are saying. And therefore I can structure my thinking a lot better. And there was this one patient where I went through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine differentials and having to ask questions for each of them. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong. But it was a lot more helpful then to kind of make sure that I have been very thorough and taken as much information as I can before I embarrassingly present to my consultant who will tell me eventually what is wrong with that patient. But it's really, really helpful to um, have this with me there because it helps writing so much. And also I get to keep the set of notes alongside the notes for my consultants in order to make sure that I'm getting better at my clinical investigations. Lastly, I can use the side to make a to-do list in hospital to write down a reminder to take down an email address of any sort of doctors that I might need to do a sign off. Um, basically anything. I am not too precious with the side of the notebook at all. If you're for some reason interested in this particular notebook itself, it's a moleskin one. I'll probably link the size and specifications down below. Um, it's absolutely amazing. I I'm quite partial to Moleskine notebooks. They feel so good and the paper is thick and beautiful and I'm just used to using these for such a long time that they are amazing. Um, and I've already got a new one because I'll keep this for hospital and probably for my other projects in daily life. I'm going to keep a daily thing. Uh, another thing that I'll add, this actually did not come with it, but getting these little pads of Amazon to just have a pen hanging off it is the most life-changing things. Uh, you lose pens so much in hospital. I have it on my like, personal journal and all my journals now. I have a pen and kind of this latch onto it, it's, it, it, will, it will change your life if you don't have it already. But yeah, just a side, tiny little note. Oh, and that's the a little disclaimer I did want to make was that this is very much for scientific subjects where taking notes from lecturers is not that important. I'm pretty sure in humanities, it might be a slightly different situation where all the information is just not, you know, on studies and published on the internet and papers that anyone can access. And you might need to kind of get the details of what the actual lecturer is saying. So this is more of the, the medical science bit. I think, hopefully. So I hope this understanding and learning side of things video was helpful. If you are interested in memorization in particular, I have a video that is the equivalent and relates very close to this that I will link down below. If you made it so far, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Be kind to yourself and others and do not believe everything you think. Thanks. Bye.